Welcome to session five of our Cyber Masterclass series presented by MCPC and McDonald Hopkins. The Cyber Masterclass is a five-part in-depth webinar event that examines the cybersecurity landscape from multiple points of view and culminates with the anatomy of a data breach. Featured panelists in the field of cybersecurity law, technology, risk management, and communications from MCPC, McDonald Hopkins, Dixon Eaton, and Oswald companies will share their expertise along with professionals from the FBI, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, an independent arm of the Department of Homeland Security, and other distinguished guests. The series will take a holistic approach in examining the clear and present danger of cyber threats, legal and cyber risk imperatives, how your technology partner drives data protection, and incident response planning, all leading up to a fascinating finale, the anatomy of a data breach, which will include a live interactive simulation showing how all of these topics come together. Because all of these sessions are interactive, we encourage you to share your questions by emailing us at events at mcdonaldhopkins.com. Session five, how it all comes together, the anatomy of a data breach begins now. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you here for our fifth and final session in the Cyber Masterclass series. First of all, thanks to, to all of our attendees. Uh, this has been a really a tremendous effort in looking at how many people have, have uh, continued to log in each and every uh, session. It's really spectacular. So thanks to everybody uh, for coming uh, to spend some time with us today. Uh, and I did want to give a shout out to our, our previous speakers. We've had so many great speakers over the, the course of this, uh, uh, this class, including uh, speakers from the FBI, from CISA, McDonald Hopkins, MCPC, Dixon Eaton, and Oswald Companies. Really, really uh, special group, and, and thanks to all of them for spending some time with us. Uh, at the end of uh, today's session, you will be receiving an email with a survey, and I would ask you to take a couple minutes and fill that out, as that really helps us as we talk about planning for this and maybe another iteration in 2021. So please fill out the survey when you get it. And for questions today, you can certainly throw them into the chat window, or you can email events at mcdonaldhopkins.com. That's events at mcdonaldhopkins.com and then I'll feed them to, to, uh, to me and the panelists uh, that we can answer them throughout the, uh, the, uh, the class today. And we'll also be taking, uh, have a Q&A with our panelists uh, after the, the session, so uh, certainly you can hold them till then if you'd like to. It's been a really interesting week when you talk about cybersecurity in the news with the, uh, the story that came out this week on FireEye and uh, the, the catastrophe that happened there with uh, a Russian, likely Russian intelligence service group who was able to steal their kind of A-level tools, um, uh, which really has a lot of significant implications when you look at you know, who are FireEye's customers, including the United States government, and just continued reminder on how important this can happen to anybody. And so classes like this on, on education are just uh, so critical. When you think about you know, FireEye this year, Garmin this year, over the last couple of years, we certainly had Maersk uh, shipping and container, Equifax, uh, and an Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. It can really happen to anybody uh, from the smallest of the small to the largest of the uh, the international companies. And so today it's really um, kind of an, uh, what, what does everything up to this point has been uh, prevention and what you should be doing to prepare. And so today is going to kind of be the execution, the response piece of it. You know, so we're going to walk through an anatomy of a data breach. And, and with me today on the, on the call, we've, we're fortunate to have really a distinguished list of security practitioners uh, we've got Chris Pruitt, whose uh, you know, who's history is he's been a speaker on this on this sessions before, uh, former CISO at Amtrust and Lincoln Electric. We've got Ronnie Munn, who's the CISO at and lead uh, IR uh, team leader for, for MCPC, uh, who's got a significant background in incident response and really leading the security practice uh, in IR for, for the company. And then we've got Colin Battersby, who's a member at McDonald Hopkins, part of their cyber practice and really an expert in data breach coaching and kind of understanding your requirements when you talk about notifications based on compliance or regulatory requirements. So that's, uh, that, that's the group we've got today. So this is gonna be uh, a lot of fun for all of us and certainly ask questions as we move, move along. And so this event is kind of a, a synthesis of several recent events that, that we have kind of put together and we think makes a lot of sense for the size of the companies that each of you, the attendees, represent, um, you know, based on ransomware, because that's what we're seeing here. 
uh, more and more often, which is just fr frustrating for all of us uh, each and every day when we have to deal with these things. I know Ronnie is going to go into detail on some some things that are, are happening that uh, he's responded to just in, this week. You know, so sc scary stat to start this is realize that these uh, uh, these bad actors are on your network for a long time. Uh, 207 days. This number has been trending down over the last couple of years, but you know we're still in triple digits, which is which is frightening. You don't want somebody physically in your space for five minutes who shouldn't be there. Um, and we've got people on networks for months and months at a time. And really, when you think about you know these these actors, you know what they're doing their network. Realize this is not generally going to be some kid in in uh, in mom's ba mom and dad's basement somewhere. These are highly organized structured organizations whose goal it is is to take your money it's all about monetization and so they've got their company structure looks just like yours looks just like mine they've got you know verticals within their company who have specific tasks and are held accountable to meet those tasks to drive revenue and so it's all about monetization whether it's initial access brokers who are trying to get on your network and then selling that online uh, you know, malware, uh, ransomware as a service, the call centers, you are going to call you and try and drive you to get you to pay, all of it driven to get to generate revenue for them. Just like our organizations are, 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 are focused on what are our end year goals and revenue and that sort of thing, they have the same goals. So realize that this is, you know, the ransomware event, I think we're, we, we've sometimes fallen into the bad habit of thinking, well, ransomware, they get on the network and they launch an attack immediately. Uh, but this is not true at all. Really, what's happening is their initial access is now going to be more similar to something like an advanced persistent threat group, um, you know, like a foreign nation state who's going to stay on your network, execute a series of tasks. Maybe that's put additional backdoors in. Maybe that's move laterally through your network, collect your data, exfiltrate your data, read your data, and start to say, when is the most vulnerable you are going to be which then equates to the most likely time that you are going to pay the ransom. Uh, we've seen a, a really, really disturbing trend of them, you know, reading through email and saying, wow, company, this company is about to execute a merger uh, today at, at, at three o'clock. So let's execute the ransomware today at noon when they're most likely to pay. So really, really scary. Uh, you know, realize what their, their intentions are. They're going to be on there once they notify you of, of the uh, of the ransom. They've been there for a while and likely have collected a lot of data. So how do you know if your network has been compromised? How prepared, how prepared are you to quickly react to a breach? The first four classes talked a lot about preparation and your response is going to be largely based, the quality of that response is gonna be largely based on the preparation you put into it. So if you put a lot of time and effort into it, it's gonna pay dividends down the road. So here we are, day zero, attacker has been in the environment for an undisclosed period of time. And uh, for the roles today, Chris Pruitt is, is playing you know, the CISO of our company. And so he is uh, the one who's managing the environment. He doesn't know what's going on. Uh, Ronnie will eventually be coming in as our, our, our team leader and Colin's gonna be our, our breach coach. So the attacker's been there, we don't know how long. And then, so who is it? So it could be any of these ransomware families. And these are all, uh, uh, you know, Typical groups out there that, that you can go buy the, the ransomware and then execute uh, based on your, your timeline. So Chris, over to you. Day one, you're starting to have some issues with accessing data on some file shares and there's some open tickets uh, that your, your employees are putting in. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, kind of the, that lead up to, uh, to day one, that, that day zero, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations I would say are, are relatively unprepared. Uh, may not have a security officer, may not have dedicated security people. So um, I, IT is often lean, uh, trying to put fires out, and, and often is the same with security, um, chasing rabbit holes, trying to fix things, trying to get things to work, um, and, and not spending enough time in uh, monitoring and responding to alerts. Well, th these, uh, these, these fires don't... Uh, um, uh, aren't catastrophes immediately. Um, typically what happens, it's you know a handful of uh, phone calls come in or emails into a uh, help desk. Hey, I can't access this. I clicked on this thing, this weird thing's going on. I got some strange message. And eventually that, that small brush fire, um, those small embers become a, a larger fire. 
Um, you know, it's, it's very important when you're talking about mean time to remediation, being able to get your arms around that small brush fire before this comes a, um, a, a, a full-blown fire that 80% uh, of your systems or more are impacted. So the, um, hey Chris, you know, what, uh, I'm curious in your experience, you know, are you, um, you know, when do these, 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 these sort of indicators of compromise tend to present themselves that, uh, that, that start to cause angst for a typical CISO? So, you know, to, early on in typical, um, you know, the, the uh, calls that come in appear to be, you know, help desk related, system related, data related, application related, um, you know, so security should be plugged into all the different areas of IT and have their finger on the pulse of those so that they can get engaged quicker. Um, but really, you know, where, where it comes to a boil is um, when uh, availability is primarily affected. Um, when, when the business can't function, when applications are down, when people can't access data, uh, alarm bells are rung all over the, uh, the enterprise, all over the organization. And that, that's really where um, the blood pressure will rise for any security officer. Great. All right, so end of day one. You know, late in the, uh, late in the day, um, you know, the afternoon, IT still isn't responding, so things are, are progressing and starting to continue to fail on the network. And so questions to be asking, are, uh, is your IT department and your employees aware and sensitive? Uh, are they looking out for these signs of ransomware? Right, and that, that's often and the how, case where, mm -hmm. where, um, ahead, where, where IT security is in the silo or IT is in the silo and they, they, they aren't necessarily sharing this information. They, they um, you know, have some context, some, uh, some key components um, that if everyone knew earlier, the meantime to uh, remediation could have been shrunk. All right, so day two, another uh, typical business day. Uh, people come to work. And then, uh, so Chris, this starts to really, uh, the, the wheels start to come off here. Uh, clearly something bad is, is happening, you know, communications down, you know, what does this look like from, from your perspective? So, you know, when R Ronnie has seen this, uh, you, you know, m many times as have I, um, you know, the, the organization day one is largely trying to get their arms around what's going on, what's affected, what's up, what's down. It's a long day. Um, IT might be engaged 18 to 20 plus hours, you know, finally uh, kind of pulling the plug at uh, one, two, three o'clock in the morning to go home just to get a couple of hours sleep um, so that they can get back in the office and, and uh, get their arms around things again. Um, you know, day one is really a scramble. Um, you know, emotions are high. A lot of business people asking what's going on? Um, what are the issues? When are we gonna be back up? You know, what uh, what do we need to do? Um, you know, are, are we engaged with uh, third parties? Um, it, it It is a scramble. Um, in day two, I think where everybody kind of, you know, collects their uh, collects their thoughts, collects their breaths early on, um, sits in a room and, and what now? Where do we go? You know, our, our business is essentially down. Uh, we don't have access to most of our, our systems. How do we recover? And so, Chris, as a, as a cybersecurity expert, former CISO, at what point now are you starting to say, listen, we need to call somebody, you know, emails down so nobody can do conduct business, you know, the business isn't functioning, people are showing up for work. Um, what, uh, what is the general trigger that, uh, you know, you start to say, look, we have got to get some help in here uh, right now? Well, if, if you're an organization that's prepared, that call would have been done on uh, on day one. But, uh, you know, here we are on day two, you know, and I, oftentimes what we see uh, day two, IT is still trying to uh, to figure it out themselves and, and not getting it done. And management takes that uh, that decision away from them. Hey, I'm going to call my friend general counsel at such and such um, or, you know, we, we've uh, we've called our cyber insurer to find out what uh, how they can help us or we know some security people and we're gonna call them and see uh, see what they can do. So uh, oftentimes this is where management has really taken the decision away from uh, from the IT organization um, because they, they they aren't getting an ETA. They're not seeing anything change. They're not seeing any, any kind of improvement and they don't know when their business is going to be back up. 
And so this is, you know, this is critical, Chris. So now the, you know, the, the, the uh, ransomware email is kind of launched across the network and why it's so critical, you know, in the first four sessions, I think we really hammered home about, you know, having those partnerships, um, you know, with, the, with, uh, with the, you know, an outside counsel who understands what a cyber data breach is, having a partner in an MSSP, you know, managed security services provider, uh, so that you know who to call. So now uh, this is what everybody is seeing on their, on their, uh, their desktop. Yeah, and this is uh, this is scary, right? You know, you, you've uh, likely um, lost all uh, all ability to communicate. You know, depending on the type of industry you're in, you may have a flood of employees who are walking into the building at 8 a.m., not knowing what to do, um, not knowing what's going on, no applications, no data. Um, you know, they're they're likely still getting paid, and and uh, you're not generating revenue. Um, you know your your internal communications, both kind of uh, within IT and outside of IT, are are poor and broken. Um, you know, in, in the event that um, maybe your email is still up, the attackers could be in there, kind of monitoring your response capabilities. You know, who's the firm that's going to come in and and do this? Um, you know, it's not uh, not unheard of. Um, you know, but from so, here, so Chris, typically. Typically now, I mean, who's uh, as a, as a former CISO, you know, who who generally are you calling to say we need um, we need to bring start bringing in outside resources to to address this threat? Well, if if I have a cyber insurance policy, they were my first call, and and with uh, with the insurance organization, they uh, they they will assign a breach coach, um, you know, you know who uh, uh, Colin can uh, um, speak about. And from there, who's the forensic company? Who is the uh, the response company? Who's the company who is going to help uh, add velocity to uh, recovery? There, there's a lot of components to this. It isn't just IT. It's not just applications and data. Um, there are a lot of uh, legal issues, a lot of complex issues around the uh, response and recovery efforts. So a lot of a lot of uh, hands and, and uh, you know, forehead and hands and a lot of frustration right now. And so the, the call would have gone out, you know, let, let, uh, to our insurance provider uh, and goes out to to Colin as a as a as a breach coach and Ronnie as uh, as an IR uh, provider. And so you've now got them as resources. Uh, what does that introduction look like? Where are you directing them to? uh within your organization to try and, and tamp this down because i'm guessing now as a CISO, everybody and their brother is calling you as much as they can trying to fix this uh probably pretty angry here on day two with nothing working um and so now you've got those resources at your um at your disposal you know the uh the best thing that i can do is arm them with uh as much information as possible so hopefully my uh I, i've been kind of guiding and uh gu guiding my team in the process along the way where we, we have good notes, what we've seen, what we've found, um, where we're at, what systems are affected. You know, here's our inventory of assets. Here, here are the critical things that are down. Um, you know, th this is, uh, you know, any uh, communication with, uh, with the attacker or ransomer, um, being able to provide as much information and intel as possible to both the uh, breach coach and for the IR team to get them up to speed. The worst thing that we can do is not really have any direction. They come in and um, everything's down and they have to start from scratch. So Colin, uh, you, you get the call and, and you're connected with Chris. I mean, where do you like to start this discussion? He kind of gives you a, a, uh, a quick back brief. You know, he's you know, kind of got uh, pretty good notes and, and on what's going on. Obviously it's a ransomware incident. Uh, what does that initial call look like for you? So ideally, we will uh, be able to sync up with uh, Ronnie as well and have one call to be efficient, kind of a scoping call where we're going to learn uh, what it is that's going on, uh, what systems are affected, what's the size of the environment, so that uh, Ronnie and his team can ultimately develop a game plan for getting getting in there, uh, preserving evidence, and dealing with restoration. So you know, we talk about as a breach coach, talk about legal issues and what notification obligations there may, may be, et cetera. Obviously, when you're dealing with this fire, your first concern is you know putting out the fire and containing it and getting the business back up and running, uh, while also balancing the issues of evidence preservation so that forensics can ultimately help us determine, all right, what do they do when they're in there? What do they touch? What do they take, if anything? And from that point, um, you know, do you have any notification obligations? But in that initial call, what we want to do is make sure we're getting you know an understanding of uh, what do your backups look like? Do you have good backups? Uh, you know what. What's the timeline event here? What is what's the group we're dealing with? 
Uh, do you have a ransom note that uh, you're familiar with, and does that ransom note threaten the taking of data? A lot of attackers are now taking data uh, as part of their uh, attempt to squeeze you for an extortion payment, whereas in the past it might have been, we have, we've encrypted your data, if you have a backup, you're going to be good. Now they take data as well so they can have a second pain point to, to press on. So do we have data that's been taken or threatened to be taken? Um, you know, kind of going to the more mundane, do you have any contracts with any of your partners because a lot of times we talk about notice obligations, uh, we're talking about state data breach laws, which are sort of, you know, we're evaluating them at the outset, but there's also, we need a lot more information at the outset uh, at, with the investigation to make some conclusions on that. But you may have some contracts with business partners that say, uh, you know, you have to tell us within 24 or 48 or 72 hours that you've had any kind of data security incident. And that's all very much language driven. There's no, you know, no industry standard. So we want to make sure that if there are any of those contracts, we're mindful of communications that need to get going. Um, so those are the, some of the topics we'll cover on that initial call. But as I said, obviously the top priority is making sure that we're we're getting uh, getting the help we need in there from a tech standpoint and, and diving in. And I'm sure, Colin, that you know Chris in his role would would ask you to reach out to probably the CEO and some C-suite, maybe the board of directors, you know, because they're probably screaming at him as well. And you, you talked about a couple of things which I think I think are really really interesting. You know, one is communication, and two is is kind of notification. And, and first on communication, you know, many companies in Northeast Ohio have, have branches throughout the, the state or the region or, or the country, uh, you know, and so when, when you know, uh, when the CEO says, look, how are we supposed to tell our, our, our factory in Omaha uh, to continue to come to work today and when they're gonna be up or what they're gonna be able to do or should we wave them off? Uh, you know, what does that look like? And on the notification side, Colin, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you talked about, you know, notifying, you know, you know, state privacy and some other things we, we can certainly talk about from a regulatory compliance issue, but I'm, I'm curious how many companies ask you about, hey, should we notify the media? And, and as we think about FireEye this week and how quick they went to the media, and maybe we, we compare that to how, quick, uh, how long it took Target you know, several years ago to notify the media and the outcome there, which was uh, largely negative. Um, you know, what does that look like when, you, when the companies say, hey, should we notify or go public with something like this? What are the the different things that you're thinking about of, of the pros and cons of notifying uh, the public? Yeah, so, so from a public standpoint, um, you know, the question really is who's going to find out about this and when? I mean, ultimately, you don't want to go, I would not advise a proactive uh, publication about this incident unless, you know, you're just getting ahead of something that's inevitable, um, you know, or, or you know, the service that you offer is such that it's going to become clear that it's down and, you know, you're going to start getting inquiry. Um, and really, even at that stage, if you know you're going to start getting inquiries, it may be that we want to prepare just a, sort of a holding statement that we're ready to release when we need to do something or say something. But, you know, when we when these things start, you know, the, it, it, may, it may follow a playbook that we've seen before, but, there, but each one of these is a different attack, and there are going to be variables that we're going to run into. And, you know, you start making statements out there uh, when you don't really know a whole lot. You put yourself in a position where you have to walk things back where you have new outside pressures that you don't need. You have more other people calling and asking questions, and you really need your team focused on dealing with the internal issues that are, are myriad. Um, and, you know, having the, uh, having the outside, the, the press calling, having, you know, maybe some business partners who you didn't need to notify who aren't actually impacted by that, calling up with their CISO. They got questions. They want to talk to your CISO about what's going on and the security of their information. You can open a can of worms by doing that. And so, you know, you want to be careful in each instance you're looking at it uh, from a you know, fact-specific inquiry, but ideally tell as little as possible for as long as possible, unless there's a reason not to. Sometimes there is. I mean, sometimes you're a situation where you, you know it's it's in the news or, uh, you know, FireEye was going to was going to be in the news pretty quickly. And so I think in that case, you know, you get out in front of it do the best you can. Um, but uh, you know, ideally, we'd, we'd uh, keep that under lock, at least until we know a lot more. Um, and then points. internally... Great point. Thank you. And then internally, you know, it's, you know, what, what can you, what can you share that's going to be accurate, that's not going to cause alarm, it's going to be necessary. Um, you know, a lot of times you want to look at, you know, you don't want a bunch of people showing up at, at to do work uh, who are just going to sit there idly and be in front of their computer that has the ransom note on it, in which case you're going to let everyone know what's going on. So, you know, if you can head them off, network security or, net, you know, network issue, we're down, we're investigating, we'll be in touch for the meantime, you know, don't connect here. Now, they'll assume some things. You have to be aware of that too. But uh, you got to balance some considerations with having everybody there and and uh, what you can get out. And again, don't you know? 
don't speculate. You don't want to say anything that you're going to have to walk back, but you have to manage. You don't want a bunch of an office full of people who can't work who are sitting around speculating. So. Great points. Great points. So, Ronnie, you were on the first call with Colin with Chris. Um, you know, what does uh, what questions are you typically typically asking, and then what does your response look like? And and it seems to be that this is always after hours and on a weekend. So uh, when you have to get the team up and running. Yeah, that's actually true. Um, they never happen at opportunistic times, that's for sure. Um, you know, so the very first question that we ask is understanding any insurance requirements in terms of what their coverage and their policy has. So we're interested in knowing those right out of the gate so we can stick to kind of that rigid process on the reporting side so the claims and all those pieces get pushed through. So the incident commander takes on a couple different roles. He's going to focus on the insurance side. He's going to focus on the federal and local law enforcement side, evidentiary procedures, and be, and, and be focused on the forensics and analysis, stick into that game plan. Oftentimes, I rally a team that come with me where I have a recovery manager who will handle the containment and the eradication, uh, and they'll begin a parallel work path to start running around the environment, understanding what we're up against, you know, collect some of that information that Colin needs in terms of a ransom note and some of the things that we need to begin, um, you know, conversations around, you know, hey, if, if there's a ransom demand, are we going to even entertain the idea of talking to this threat actor? Do we want to find out what the ask is? Do we want to find out what they claim to have in terms of exfiltrated data, et cetera? And then from the containment side, those guys have very strict procedures on how they can provide that containment without interrupting any of the evidence gathering processes. So as an example, if we have a virtual environment and their virtual servers, you know, they're, they're trained to be able to suspend these machines to be able to capture volatile memories for forensic analysis as opposed to just shutting everything down. Same thing with a workstation or a desktop. You know, they're going to unplug a network cable as opposed to powering it off. So if we need to find patient zero, we have some, you know, some breadcrumbs that we can follow to get there. Uh, and then thirdly, we have a, a, another work stream that's going to be more on the communication side, the case management side, and, you know, the scribe, if you will. We got guys documenting time, date, stamps, inventory, what each one of the team members is doing from a, a timeline perspective. Uh, you know, they're putting all of this into a single case file. Oftentimes we use code names so we don't, um, you know, any conversations don't uh, identify the, the, uh, the victim. And then set up a war room for regular touch points to where at any point in time, if the uh, the board of directors or the CEO, they want any of that information. They have the ability to dip in, dip out, get the information that they need. Colin can dip in, dip out. Obviously, Chris is able to get uh, regular updates anytime that they need. And we've got a whole team dedicated to just communicating what's going on, who's working on what, and what the estimated timelines are. And Ronnie, a couple a couple interesting points in there. One is is you know the the touch points uh, that you're you're establishing with the victim company. Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's critical to you know on your experience and, and Chris and Colin, please chime in. You know, what is the 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 uh, you know, the, the the cadence of those generally in that first say you know two, three, four, five days? I mean, it's it's I would think it'd be pretty routine, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's oftentimes up and running, uh, you know, kind of 24-7, if you will. Uh, most of the times we have scheduled uh, appointments with very specific individuals on a two-hour interval, interval for the first probably three or four days. Um, board of directors get a daily touch point. And then, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of the longer play when everything's contained and services start to come back online and we're working a punch list, uh, you know, to, you know, kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Th those get much, you know, fewer and farther between, you know, oftentimes maybe, you know, twice a day or at some point it even gets down to just one time a day. But that's often a seven to ten day, you know, until you get to that point, you got a couple few days there. And Colin, is that something that you typically like to be a part of? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things we do is, as attorneys here, besides co counsel on notification obligations, is, is cloak this investigation and privilege. So um, we do want to be involved in most of the discussions. Uh, to, to have that conversation be privileged. Um, so, you know, that's, it is important that we get involved in those and we typically do uh, in that cadence, you know, depending on the, on the specific incident. Yeah. That's common to have several calls a day and then taper off as, as, as needed. You obviously want your folks focusing on uh, doing the work and not uh, over, you know, you know, death by meeting, but as long as there's you know, good stuff to be accomplished by that, then, uh, you know, it's, it, it, there usually is. Uh, that's, that's about right. 
And, and Ronnie, a couple of follow-up things. Like, what is generally the uh, the mood of the organization here as we are on day two when everybody realizes that uh, the network has been had and, and they've been victimized? Um, nothing's up and running. You guys are starting to come online. Uh, and I, I really want to follow up too quickly on you, know, you mentioned something on building that kind of evidentiary case file on how critical that is and why you do that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of that is done, you know, for, you know, legal purposes in terms of the case file. Um, to answer your first part of the question, it, it, it's full-blown crisis at this point. Um, depending on what you're dealing with and what vertical and how, what the impact is to the organization or their clients, uh, it, it can vary. Um, I've been in manufacturing environments where every minute that they're down, uh, you've got a COO that is constantly concerned. You've got guys on the shop floor that don't know what's going on, people standing around unproductive. It is, it is, it is a very high pressure, high tension situation in a lot of cases. Now, there have been other ones where they can continue to function it's very disruptive in terms of things like billing or, you know, procurement or something to that effect. But the core of their business can continue to function without an IT system. So there's a, there's a large degree of variability there, depending on what the vertical or what the company focuses on. Um, there's quite a bit. And, and we, we mentioned, uh, hey, we're on day two. Uh, there, there becomes quite a bit of churn because oftentimes as we start the, the forensic gathering you know, process, we find out that we've got encumbrances because the company tried to fight it with the IT department themselves for the first day. And they may have re-imaged the system, they may have taken something else offline, lost some kind of data, firewall logs may have rolled over, you name it, we've seen it. Uh, so getting us involved immediately as opposed to waiting to day two is oftentimes very important in terms of evidence gathering because there's a lot of destruction of that evidence that takes place on day one. And then when you try to figure that out on day two on top of all the other pieces and then they find out that all that nice fighting that they did on day one was A, for not, and then B, caused a bunch of additional problems uh, and, and could potentially mean they can't identify exactly what's happened, how the guys got in you know, what, what data might, may or may not have been exfiltrated, et cetera, it can have a cascading effect throughout the entire case. So from a case management perspective, we're gathering all those things. If we gather the evidence, we're taking chain of custody forms, hashing the data to make sure that it can withstand any, you know, allegations that the data may have been altered in any way, and then make sure that we're preserving that and getting it off site into a lab where it can be forensically accessed in a lot of cases. There are times where we, we do the analysis on site, but it's much more efficient if we if we move it to a lab. And, and as we look at the questions at the, at the top of the slide here, I mean, these are these are great questions that uh, I'm sure Ronnie and, and, and Colin would be asking. And if you, as we uh, highlighted in the first four sessions of the series, if you have these things done ahead of time, it's uh, it's a lot easier for um, your 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 counsel, your lawyers to kind of execute on certain things, your insurance provider and your IR partner. So you know if you have that uh, that preparation in place, uh, really really critical. And, and Ronnie, uh, you know, so as we as day two goes on, um, things are you know still continue to fall apart. I'm sure financial systems are impacted, so people are wondering if they're going to get paid you know on Friday. Uh, if the stress level continues to go up, what does uh, what does the typical day of the IR team like uh, start and end look like now? And I know you've got resources, you know, scattered across the country. You can remote in uh, to a, a victim's uh, to support a victim. Uh, what does their typical day look like? Uh, I mean, it's fast paced. It's uh, it's long. Um, you know, there's quite a bit of you know trying to understand you know the baseline, understand what we're up against. You know, we have conversations, uh, you know, pending the permission of the customer to talk to federal law enforcement, the FBI. We get some uh, reputational based statistics on tactics, techniques, practices that the attackers would typically go through. So that gives us some good indication on where we should be looking in the environment, what else we should be potentially, you know, concerned with and everything up to and including do they have a re reputation of actually providing, you know, what they promise if you do indeed pay them. So we, we gather that information. And then we start combing through the environment to find out if we see any of those indicators of compromise that are typically associated with that variant of, of ransomware or malware strain that's going through there. Uh, and in conjunction with that, we've got the recovery teams that are looking to contain it. And they're, they're boots on the ground. We typically dispatch them and have them, you know, pull in cables, uh, you know, gather a lot of this evidence for the forensic team, et cetera. And then the 
more technical guys, they are uh, remoting in. They're finding ways to get out of band communication set up for the customers so they can have communications that are not flowing through compromised systems. Um, and, and then, you know, having the ability to start the, uh, you know, containment phase and the eradication phase of these things, deploying different tools for those services and those, those tactics that we use to help get this under control. And I, I know, Ronnie, in, 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 uh, in some previous instances, I worked with you that, you know, that out-of-band communication could literally be Gmail uh, if need be so that the company can continue to function at some level. And you, you brought up federal law enforcement. As a retired federal law enforcement agent, uh, I'd really love to hear from all, all three of the panelists, you know, kind of talk through quickly the pros and cons of, of notifying, you know, the FBI or U.S. Secret Service. And if you're a defense contractor, probably needing to notify DOD uh, and or CISA. Uh, you know, what uh, what does that decision making process look like, you know, as you're in each of your three roles as Chris is CISO, Colin is breach coach and Ronnie is the IR uh, uh, leader? Yeah, I've, I've been um, I, I've had that question uh, that that question put to me before. Um, and, you know, one that uh, I don't know that, you know, I'd always felt that it was above, uh, above my pay grade. But, you know, why do we need federal law enforcement uh, here? Are they going to take our servers? Uh, what value are they going to provide? Are they going to start going through our financials or other things? Um, you know, I, I think there's this concern that, you, you know, we're uh, we're from the government. We're here to help. Uh, the old uh, Ronald Reagan <laughs> quote. Um, you know, th there are some executives that feel like that. But, you know, I think the FBI and others have done a great job in, in kind of posturizing uh, their capabilities in what they do, how, you know, we are here to help. And they've got a lot of intel and a lot of other things, and they're trying to use the intelligence that you have and can provide in uh, in their daily fight. Yeah, so my, my, um, yeah my, my, um, I generally do like, we do generally like to bring the FBI in. Um, we do like to, as, let's let our forensic folks get in and get the evidence that they need uh, if we can first, because, you know, in a lot of instances, when you report to the FBI, it may even go into the uh, into the air. You do it through a website, and they don't take a particular interest in it. But sometimes you can run into a situation where they do, and they want to gather evidence. And if they take the evidence before there's an image made of it or before our forensic team can do what they want, then you could put yourself in a bit of a situation where you have some gaps in, in your analysis, and you may, you know, that, that server may be gone for some time. It'll come back, but it might be, you know, it might be altered. It might be not uh, not what you need. So. Ideally, we would collect what we need first, um, and then we would bring them in and let them know what's going on. You know, the timelines on that can be can be different based on the you know the facts of the case. Um, I've had a had a matter recently where the attacker was um, reaching out with uh, highly threatening uh, communications to the employees of the of the victim. Um, that sort of that that put me on alert. Maybe think that you know probably nothing, but this is the kind of time when you want to maybe alert law enforcement a little quicker than you might otherwise have done that. Uh, of course, we also see circumstances where law enforcement contacts us. They can sometimes be the first uh, first indication there's an issue. You'll hear uh, you'll, you'll hear from a client that the FBI contacted them and told them their information was out there and something was going on. Um, so you know, I, there is a little bit of that I think uh, fear at first when when you're dealing with law enforcement, at least from the client side. You know, am I under investigation? And, and it's always been my experience. It's always been very positive. Our clients are the are the crime victims. The FBI is there to help. They have a slightly different goal. It's not necessarily getting you back up and running and like it's trying to catch a bad guy. But those are, you know, those, those do, uh, we have that interest too. So, you know, we ultimately will work with them and get them the information that they need for their case. And then I think, you know, when you deal with a ransom situation where you're going to pay with some of the most recent guidance out of Treasury, um, you're very likely going to want to report to the FBI when you make that payment. That's a, that's a decision that I think is is almost required at this stage. So, you know, that and what, the timing of that can, can be discussed based on the facts, but, you know, we're ultimately gonna be dealing with law enforcement if we're making our pay, pay ransom payment. Well, those are all great points. And to, and to Chris's point, you know, I think, Chris, it's, it's, it's been interesting looking at the FBI as kind of how they've involved, uh, evolved their cyber investigative process. Whereas, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, they would come on site and then suddenly say, hey, we need to seize a server you know, bring a truck around back and, and, and start pulling stuff off of a rack, uh, which is is um, a, a little challenging, obviously, when you want to talk about getting your company up and running. And and I know this year and working with with Ronnie is is uh, on a number of instant responses when we've contacted the FBI and Ronnie, please correct me if I'm wrong. I, 
I don't know that the FBI has come on site for any except for maybe one. And I think we've uh, we've actually uh, they just said, hey, they've told they've told uh, told us what we want to collect, what they want us to collect, and we would uh, submit it to them. And it is important to note that uh, law enforcement, um, you know, whether it's state, local, federal, uh, is not going to notify the media. Um, and so, you know, but their their goals, as Colin said, are different than than everybody on the call here. They're different than Chris's goal is, is the CISO. They're different than Colin's goal is the breach coach and different than Ronnie's goal is, is the, uh, the, the the leader of the, the IR team there. You know, their goal is to collect evidence and an investigation to eventually put somebody in jail. So they are not there to uh, to help mitigate and they're not gonna sit at a keyboard and try and fix anything. So that's uh, just some things to keep in mind as you talk about uh, when to get law enforcement involved. And I, I think they can be helpful um, if you get in touch with the right groups um, at FBI or Secret Service um, within DHS, as Ronnie highlighted, understanding the, the the TTPs, the techniques, tactics, and procedures of the adversary, that specific adversary can be helpful as Ronnie and his team uh, are trying to uh, determine uh, what direction to go on a network when they're looking for the indicators of compromise. Ronnie, anything else to add on that? Yeah, I do. I, you know, there's a couple pieces now with the recent OFAC sanctions. They do are able to give you some information on what they've seen in previous cases around those. So you can't take that as a standard, but it definitely helps, you know, kind of inform the situation on how you should be advising the victim moving forward. Same thing in terms of the reputation of the attacker. Hey, uh, if you pay them, do they uh, provide the decryption key? The, the, the decryption key? Do they take the data down? Do they shred it? Do they ha have they had any scenarios where they post that data even though you've paid? Um, do they even have a reputation of posting data or is it, a, is it not a credible threat? Uh, all those things are very valuable pieces of information that we can inform leadership within that, uh, that organization so they can help make those business decisions that they have to, uh, you know, kind of make on the fly, especially for the companies that are not prepared, that don't do that preparation, the tabletop exercises, et cetera, to be able to have a lot of those answers, you know, formulated ahead of time. And in terms of, you know, how helpful they are. I mean, Gunnar, you kind of hit it on the head. They're, they're dealing with the macro problem, right? And each one of us individually are fighting these individual micro issues. So any information that we can help speed up to them at the end of this is a value add for them, but it is never a scenario where I've had them demanded. It's always been predicated on is the customer willing to share? And if they are, we'll be happy to take it. Have them fill out an IC3 report, a uh, Internet Crime Complaint Center report, and, and submit that data through some secure channels that we have uh, from the forensic side of things so they can add that to the case so they can continue to build the profile of that particular attacker. And then it also feeds into the intelligence of the next IR for that particular piece uh, to continue to help everybody get better moving forward. So I find them very valuable. Um, I think that they're one of the very first phone calls that I like to make. And then Gunnar, you and I oftentimes work with getting to the appropriate field office where they specialize in that particular variant. And if you can get to uh, the field office that specializes there and get a case agent that's an SME and it, it can be very, very valuable in helping reduce the overall time it takes to contain and eradicate that threat out of that environment. And Ronnie, you know, tying you back into kind of your day one and day two actions, you know, the, and, and, and even what, you know, Colin's actions and Chris's actions on the network, you know, having all of that documented into a case file is critical to any law enforcement agency moving forward if, if evidence is turned over because ultimately you may get called to testify in court to what you did on a network or Chris may get called or Colin may get called. So things to think about. So we're into day three now. Who is typically now negotiating with the adversary over the ransom? Uh, Ronnie, uh, let's let's start with you. I mean, who do, who typically is, is gonna you know start to respond and talk about what it is an appropriate ransom to pay? So it really depends on the breach coach and who they they really um, have used in the past. Uh, my team can provide those services, but oftentimes we're focused on a different set of efforts and then there becomes another work stream or swim lane that is going to begin with the negotiation and communication side of things. So we would, we would either dedicate resources to start having those conversations to reach out to the attacker, find out what our time frame is gonna be, find out what the ransom demand is, 
oftentimes they'll want evidence. Um, uh, they call them proof of life. So you give them three images that have been encrypted. They will provide evidence to you that they can decrypt those files. So you, you start to build a little bit of confidence into their capabilities. And then you can get some intel that you can bring back to the organization to begin some discussions around, hey, that, that what's the ask? How much time do we have to pay it? What uh, flavor of um, you know cryptocurrency are they taking? Do they want Ethereum? Do they want Monero? Do they want you know Bitcoin, etc.? And then start having those conversations with Colin that hey, they do claim to have uh, they do claim to have exfiltrated data. Uh, so we would begin asking them during those negotiations, hey, can you prove that you have any of that exfiltrated data? And oftentimes they do provide evidence of here's the, you know, here's a file that contains all the files that we've taken or screenshots of uh, the data on their servers or whatever. And we'll bring all that back to Colin and start to help him understand what he's up against in terms of the privacy side of things, the disclosure and communication side of things. So Colin, it's, it's over to you. Ronnie's, uh, you know, going to give you some information. He's now working on backups and everything else with Chris probably. And, and you're now, um, you know, looking to having to negotiate with this uh, with this threat actor from God knows where. Uh, what, what's going through your mind as, a, as the, the CEO is breathing down your neck trying to get you to pay the ransom to decrypt the network? Yeah, so, you know, the question, first of all, is are we paying a ransom? Um, do we need to, uh, what, are the, what, what are we considering? So do we have, what's the status of our backups? Do we need a little bit of runway to figure that out? Because, I mean, a lot of times we'll start an investigation and we think we've got good backups, but it's going to take some time to be clear on that and be sure that we're going to actually be able to bring them, bring them out and use them properly. Um, what sensitive data do we think that it is that they took? Um, because the reason that you engage with the attacker is uh, for, you need the key, you got you need to unlock things and you have no other choice, or they've taken some sensitive data that is so sensitive that you want to pay them to delete it uh, rather than have it be out there. Um, and you know, the, the, Unfortunate part of that second piece is you're still going to have to notify folks whose information was taken if it's sensitive. There's not any you know hush money you can pay to buy yourself out of notice obligation. But those are the two things that you're you're thinking about, and where you are in the investigation is, is going to be important for answering those questions. Sometimes we will engage with the attackers with not an expectation of actually having to pay them, but because we want to get some intel from them, uh, we want them to prove to us what they took. You know the the ideal forensic outcome is going to be. Way of, perfect visibility of everything the attackers did on the system, what they interacted with, what they took. I've yet to see one of those actually play out that way. They cover their tracks, they use great tools, um, that some of which run in memory that don't leave pieces behind. And so you want to use what you can get from the attacker to maybe supplement the forensic findings that you're, that you're going to get based on what's left. So there are a couple of different, you know, it's, it's not so cut and dry that necessarily we're reaching out to them to pay. Sometimes we're using them as a source for intelligence on the issue. But if we are going to pay them, we need to, okay, what if we if we have a if we need the key, you know we just need to get that as low as that 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 that, that uh, ask as low as we can get it. And the question there is how much time do we have to do it, and how how low can we get this group? I mean we do have good stats on what each group is likely to uh, to shave off their initial ask. Um, so we want to deal with that, and then 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 that issue of the data, you know how valuable is it? Is it the, is it the uh, the secret recipe for Coke? Well then we're going to probably pay some money for that to be deleted. Is it some information that's, you know, maybe maybe wouldn't really like to be out there, but uh, it's not worth, you know, five hundred thousand dollars that was deleted. Those are the kind of considerations and discussions we're going to have to have. So, um, you know, we we it, how what our posture is and what we need to accomplish will really uh, color a lot of those discussions and, and how we reach out and, and the initial posture we take with them. And obviously, the investigation evolves if we find out first we think we have good backups, but then we realize they've been corrupted. Then that you know that may change things. So it's a it's an evolving process, and you know, in almost all cases, it makes sense to reach out to them and at least kind of find out what they want and keep them on the line um, so we can let those kinds of things play out, at least in my experience. That's great. So, Chris, it's it's day three, and, and as, a, as a former CISO and, and, and having been, you know, uh, worked on a number of, of, of IR data breach incidents, you know, what does the what's the typical CISO's day look like now? Ronnie's got people in-house. Um, He's meeting with you and your team every two hours, you know, probably six or seven times a day. Uh, you know that, that Colin and his team are, are trying to negotiate with somebody online. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that uh, everybody's beating you up for your backup strategy and, and, and what, what, what backups are where. So what does, uh, what's going through your mind on a, on a typical kind of day three? You know, I, I would say your, your 
kind of atypical IT person. You know, one, they are poor communicators and, um, you know, maybe not uh, have great strategy. And, and what, uh, what I think we often see as a result of that during these kind of firefights, um, you know, there are a lot of people tugging it, uh, uh, it, it you know, who, whoever, whether it's the security officer, the CIO, who's ever kind of the lead IT person. You've got uh, management asking what's going on, give me updates, when are we going to get these systems back, what's going on. You've got the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the calls that are going on frequently every couple of hours or a couple of times a day with the entire team to kind of get through the process. You have all of these business people really pushing on uh, business normalcy. We need to get back up as soon as possible. Um, forensics takes time. The investigation takes time. Notification, or, or not a notification, the um, uh, uh, ransomware negotiation takes time. Um, it, it may seem like it is a long, drawn out process. Um, and it's even worse when you're unprepared. Um, for backups, you know, what we'll often see uh companies haven't tested their backups and uh what, what's your likelihood for recovery or all of our data is in the cloud well what kind of internet bandwidth do you have to recover four terabytes of data it's going to take you four weeks um so you know this is where the decryption key becomes more valuable but even that process takes a lot of time so you, you know you have a a very time sensitive issue um, a lot of pressure is coming from every direction, you, you know, and you are, is kind of the, that lead are trying to herd cats. You know, I've, I've got these incident responders that are running around trying to uh, get the bad guys out and, and get us back up. I've got, you know, all of these legal issues and legal conversations happening and negotiations and when are we going to get this key so that we can start on things. Um, and the, the, the business people breathing down our, our neck, second guessing every decision that we've ever made. We, you know, what do you mean we only back our systems up, you know, once a day? Um, you know, what, what, uh, what do you mean it's offsite and it's gonna take us a week? You know, all of the financial pressures that CIOs and security officers have had to deal with now come to a head. So we're, we're moving into kind of three and four here as we come up on the hour mark. and and uh, so we, we uh, in this uh, in this uh, tabletop exercise, you know, the backups are, are are starting to work here. We're starting to pull those down off the internet, and and things are are starting to maybe trend towards the positive, which is a good sign. You know, Colin, what do your discussions look like with the adversary and with the CEO on to pay, not pay, uh, if there's a a ransom out there? I mean, that has got to be a, a tough decision. Do we want to pay this uh, this adversary, you know, five hundred thousand dollars? Um, you know, to get, you know, some files back and there's no guarantee. I mean, what does that, uh, uh, as an attorney, what does that, 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 that decision-making process look like for you as you're engaging on, on, on the, with, the, with the board and the C-suite and with the adversary? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're constantly looking for as much information as we can get in the recovery process, right? So, I mean, it's day four. Um, we have good indicators that our backups are, you know, in the cloud and untouched. Um, Obviously, there are some limitations with the bandwidth and getting them restored. Um, you know, what it, a lot of this will be a function of how much time do we have. Um, you know, there there are threat actors and, and the negotiators will tell you we can stretch these guys out for a couple of weeks if you know if we engage in these negotiations, we can give ourselves more time to figure out whether we're going to need it or not. I mean, you don't you hate to have to make a decision on day four when things are looking good to pay these guys. With just because it might turn bad later. I mean, you, you want to kind of maybe keep them stretched as long as you can. There may be instances where, you know, we're down, we're losing half a million dollars a day, and, and if we can get this key, we're going to stop that bleeding a whole heck of a lot faster. So it's a business decision that's made to hold your nose and pay it. Um, a lot of the time, and, you know, this is maybe where uh, Ronnie and Chris will, will agree, I think, you know, it, it's, it's cleaner to restore from backup, but, I mean, there may be some times when it's uh, when it's more exigent to pay for the key and get it. So there's a lot of pieces that are moving. Uh, you know, you don't want to pay these guys. Most of the time, uh, they will come through with the key and and, uh, and and get that to you. You're seeing a few instances where that doesn't happen. It's, it's unlikely, but still it exists. You're not absolutely buying certainty. You're also not buying 100% decryption rate. You're going to have some issues with corruption that have occurred. So you got to consider some of those pieces when you're deciding, what is this worth to our business in this moment? What are we going to know more later that we don't know now that might influence that decision? 
and how does that you know factor into what we need to do now? Um, if we if things look good with backups and we're gonna know and we're gonna feel pretty good about that in a day or two or a week and we have the time, then you know let's stretch out these talks and let's tell the attacker, look, we don't need we don't need we don't think we need the key. We're, we're really interested more in data destruction if you have it. Um, use some of those as talking points to negotiate and pressure them down and get them to a point where uh, you know you're getting as low as can be. So um, you know it's a, a lot a lot of business thinking uh, into the negotiation. And Colin, I would think you're trying to balance that with you know the CEO, of the board, who's now probably starting to beat you up a little bit, and and Ronnie and and Chris as well on notification requirements. If they're a, a DoD contractor, they need to notify you know. Um, right notify DOD of a data breach, but I mean, sometimes it's not cut and dried that there was a data breach. There might be in potential indicators of compromise, and Ronnie has, has dealt with this numerous times lately, as have you, Colin. And so what, um, you know, how do you talk, you know, the typical kind of see off the ledge who probably saying, listen, I want to notify right now because, you know, we may have had a breach. Uh, you know, what, do, what does that discussion look like? Well, so you mentioned uh, DOD a couple of times, and with that one, you don't have a lot of discretion. You've got 72 hours. You've got to get something in, and uh, you know, and you can walk it back later if it turns out you're fortunate that it weren't uh, weren't impacted. But when it comes to the others, you know, we we are the, the discussion really is we we have so much we still need to know, and we are uh, you know we know a lot more now than we did when when it was day zero and day one, but there's still a lot to be figured out. You know, has there actually been a compromise of data? I mean. I kind of missed the good old days a year ago when most ransomware attacks were just blocking up your data and, and holding you ransom for the key, and if you had good backups, you were good. And, you know, now we've got all these data issues that are that are popping up. Um, but you know, you, you don't have the ransom the ransomware itself in most instances. At least we're talking about state laws, and there are some some other areas that, that, that where this varies a little bit. But the attack of the ransomware itself is not does not is not a data breach. It's not a uh, a, a notifiable event. Under some of the, under these state laws, it's the compromise of data that comes out as a result of that. Did the attacker, you know, access personal information or take it out of the network? And we need to use the forensic investigation. I mean, one of the goals of that is certainly what you know, get them out and get them cleaned up, uh, get the place cleaned up. But you know, what do they actually do in there? You don't want to go and just notify everybody. You know, you you when you over notify, you tell some people who maybe don't need to know, and then you have some people who didn't need to know who now are upset about something they shouldn't have been upset about, and now they are calling you or suing you um, because of your zeal to, to notify. So I respect the instinct that we want to be transparent, we want to be you know out there in front of this stuff, and um, you know we're crime victims, and we're gonna let these people know. But let's find out who these people are first, right? I mean, you, you, if you don't have, if, if their information wasn't compromised, you don't want to notify them. So uh, those are the conversations you, you want to try to have uh, and uh, you know, understanding the instinct and the desire to, to do those things and try to talk people off the ledge and let's, let's get more facts so that we can communicate accurately and then we can decide how to approach this. And, and Colin, the, the noti notification is a, a gray area, right? You know, when, if, you, if you have an obligation to notify, is it at the close of the investigation? Is it um, I, uh, when, when there is a... Uh, um, uh, evidence of uh, data access or, or data removal. Um, you know, I, I think some uh, some organizations will hide behind the fact that ongoing investigation, and they may sit on information for months and months, which is an advantageous um, certainly. But um, you, you know, I, I think that you know whether you're working with the DoD, you may have some requirement, you may have contractual obligations just on security incident notification, uh, right. not necessarily breach. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about the the state laws, um, which are you know, everyone has one, every fifty states, fifty states have them, and you know some of them require notice after thirty days, some after forty five, some after some uh, you know without unreasonable delay. Um, but you know this is one another important point. Uh, you only notify when there's been a breach, and a breach is so we want to be real careful when we're not we're not throwing around the word breach when we're in the middle of these investigations here because we don't have that yet. And our time starts when we've confirmed there's been access to um, protected information, somebody's name in combination with, you know, the big three would be social, driver's license number, and so financial information. But it's when we get to that point that we really, that we start our clock running and that we want to start getting the, the, notif the notification obligation has been triggered and we want to make sure we're getting it out within the, the appropriate window. The fun thing is about this is it's the law where the person lives that controls what you have to do, not 
where you, where you do business or you know where they lived when you did business with them. It's where they currently are. So we have to look at all those things. But that you know that that's in the back of our minds at all times. Really, at the minute this starts, what type of sensitive data do you deal in? Where is it on your system? Um, and then once we confirm there's been a compromise of it, you know, we have to sift through it and see whose information is actually impacted before we generate a notification list. And that's when we have a breach. Um, so you know, we may have a suspected breach uh, you know, with certain groups in particular. We're going to say that they almost always take data. The question is, did they take protected data? Uh, and we got to investigate that and uh, from there make our decisions. Yes, Colin. We all we all miss the days when ransomware was just uh, was was just <laughs> ransomware and not an extortion. That that would be great if we could go back to that. We had a question from the audience, which I think falls into kind of Chris and Ronnie's lane, uh, asking about kind of the quality of recovery tools. You know, what um, what does the uh, what what's what's the, the 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 variety out there of kind of recovery tools in the IR process? Well, a lot of times we're subject to what tools the uh, the victim had available to them. There have been cases where we've recovered data uh, by forensics. Uh, one particular case, the attacker had uh, you know exfiltrated everything, packed it all up, kind of left it on the doorstep, left it into some performance libraries and things like that that uh, was a little bit sloppy on their part. Uh, and then when they went to the restores, we ended up restoring data, but based off of the restore point that the customer had available to them, they lost about six months worth of data. So based on the forensic findings that we had, a lot of the data that they exfiltrated, we were actually able to recover current data and then blend it together with the restored data that would have had that delta and we were able to minimize the impact of that. Um, you know, in terms of the, the actual tools that we use, we have our own toolkit of quite a few things that we can bring to the table, but a lot of the times we're subject to the, you know, not just from the forensic side of things in terms of evidence gathering, what tools the, and controls that the, uh, the victim had in place at the time, but also on the recovery side, you know, uh, look at backups as an example. Uh, there's a lot of times where all the backups get encrypted as well, and they've got zero capability of actually restoring, and that's when you introduce those conversations around getting that decryption key and going down that path. Yeah, you know, I think to echo, um, you know, R Ronnie's uh, line there, um, if you're asking your incident response firm about your recovery, about their recovery tools, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, it's it's expensive, it's long, um, your likelihood for success is, is going to be marginal. Um, you know, there are times that Ronnie and team have to go in and, and do forensically recover data and they're, you know, well, we may have a 30% shot at this. Um, you know, we're, we're not really sure. But backups are critical. Um, you know, how are they stored? How are they protected? Um, is your team gone through any uh, recovery tests and scenarios where, you know, if you do have to recover 100 or 1,000 servers or 3,000 servers, what does that look like? You know, what, what time frame are you uh, talking about there? Where's your data? Um, where are the bottlenecks? You know, you, you want your business back up. Well, um, you, need, you need to be sure that you are testing those processes and that you have processes. And to dive just a little bit deeper on the backups, over the you know the years that I've been doing this, I've learned that I don't I don't care about the backups. Everybody says we've got backups, but if you don't have the ability to restore, they don't do any good. One of the most recent um, cases that I ran about a month ago, uh, they had uh, the three two one model for backups in place, uh, both on the DR side, the production side. All of the backups got hit on both sides. Uh, they could restore to tape, but it was a month old. The recovery efforts all revolved around doing restores from, you know, storage arrays, from LUNs on the storage array to be able to gather the, the data there. And the restore was what mattered. They had all the backups they could possibly ever make as an organization, a lot of due diligence there, but no air gap, no immutable backups. And guess what? Every one of those got compromised during that particular incident. And it was the storage array that was able to provide the restore, which was what really mattered. So. Restores are the key, and if you're not testing the backups and the efficacy of those, and knowing that you are able to, you know, understand the time frame that it takes, the point in times that you can recover to, uh, you know, the 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 business impact analysis, uh, meaning what what servers I bring up in what order in order to start restoring critical functions and begin to slowly bring the business back up, those are the successful victims in these scenarios where they can recover 
a lot quicker. Uh, the opposite is most often what we see. Great points. So Colin, uh, as, as a breach coach now here, kind of day four, things are starting to settle down a little bit. You know, things may or may not be coming back up online and, and, uh, in, a, in a good order for the business. Uh, what do discussions look like with the board and the CEO and uh, as, as suppliers and employees and stakeholders start to really question what is going on because the network is still, you know, mostly down? Yeah, I mean, we're at this point, we're still trying to, I mean, you, you're probably going to have to be a little bit more direct uh, if you're getting those kinds of questions. Uh, you know, we still want to be careful. Same principles apply. You know, we're, we're, we know more, but we don't, we still don't know the whole thing. At day four, we probably don't have a very good idea of even whether data was taken or not. Um, so, you know, and that's one of the topics that's usually on employees' minds is, you know, is my information out there now? And so you have to be careful with that messaging. Um, you know, we're, we're at this stage, we're probably—I don't know if we're going all the way to a ransomware attack in the communication, but we're maybe dealing with the data security issue. We're working with outside experts who are regularly investigating these things. Um, you know, it's investigations ongoing. Depending on what you know, you may say make a statement that you you don't have any reason to believe data has been taken yet. Although, if you're dealing with certain groups, uh, you may want to be careful with that phrasing because, you know, like I said, you don't want to walk things back uh, later, um, and you, know, you can. You can make it you know, temporal. It's, it's at this time we don't know, but if you think they might have, you want to be careful with that. But it's it's a, a principle of again, you know, you know, you don't want to over notify, you don't want to be bogged down in that, but you have to keep your people um, confident in you, uh, you know. And so it's a, it's a fine line to walk. Uh, you, you if you don't say anything, you're gonna it's the rumor mill is gonna say things for you. Um, so you want to try to uh, make sure that that's uh, that's being handled. And again, it's gonna be really um, entity specific. Um, you know, some corporations have, have uh, cultures where you can get away, or, or the, even the systems that are hit are such that they're not so impactful that people aren't necessarily going to be talking about it. Um, or, you know, the culture is such you only have a number of uh, high-level employees that need to know and you keep them in the, uh, in the loop. Um, but uh, when the questions start, you got to start uh, getting ahead of that and, and creating some messaging. It's just really as, as little as possible to keep them informed, uh, and not really even to be... Uh, to be uh, coy for the sake of being coy, you just really are letting this play out and there's a lot more to learn. Uh, so uh, as, as little as possible, but usually there's gonna be some necessary internal discussion about what's going on so that they know that you're on it and they can have some of their concerns assuaged. And I think it's important to note at this point, you know, here, if we're on a typical kind of incident, if, if there is such a thing on day four, you know, both Chris and your staff, Colin, you and your team, um, and then Ronnie, you and your team are probably working, you know, you've got somebody working almost around the clock still, right? I mean, I would think we'd still be in the, you know, have people at, at keyboard and working on things 20 to 24 hours a day. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely, at least from my perspective. And the customer is, you know, you've got crisis paranoia and then you start combining fatigue with that as well. It starts to really compound, uh, you know, when additional pressure comes from leadership, it, it, it becomes a true crisis uh, management situation. Yeah, three, uh, you know, three or four days in, those uh, 18 to 20 hour days start to stack up. Um, you know, the, the stresses, just the pressure, it's, um, you know, it, it is quite a bit. Um, and, you know, it, it's expected, and I think often expected that the, um, that the IT team and other people that can impact this, can try to uh, assist in the recovery effort are, are working long, long days. Um, you know, it, it, it really is important to uh, tell people, go home, get some rest, get some food, come back uh, fresh. You know, I, th I think Ronnie and I have both seen teams that were burned out too much and either it led to um, uh, misfires where um, people were trying to do things and, um, uh, you, you know, were inaccurate in what they were doing. They were working on things that maybe weren't going to add value because they were so tired and really, really just couldn't think through the process. Well, I, I think it's it's uh, it's important to kind of circle back to something Ronnie said early on when he talked about you know uh, one of the key members on his team is a project management expert uh, who keeps track of the hundreds if not thousands of tasks that are going out uh, during this week uh, regardless of whether it's you know in the uh, the IR company or not but uh, really kind of keeping track of who's working on what 
um, it is really, really critical. I know I've, I've seen it this year, and, and uh, Ronnie, you can certainly speak to you know your, your team there, but having that person function as that uh, project manager uh, and just keeping track of all tasks, everybody can see what the tasks are and who's working on it, really uh, is, is an important function. Well, so let's see, moving on here, ransom negotiations are continuing. Uh, we talked about the encryption. We talked about, you know, allowing law enforcement to uh, at, least, at least work with the, with the IR team. Uh, they're really not gonna participate in the IR, but hopefully working kind of off the side and they're feeding information that, that's relevant back to, back to the group. Uh, we certainly talked about uh, insurance and, and the OFAC considerations. If, if anybody on the call hasn't read the OFAC, um, um, letter that came out, I think it was on 1 October this year, the advisory notice, uh, certainly something really, really interesting. I know that, uh, that we internally have talked about on every incident we've been on this year. Uh, it's a consideration. I'm sure that, uh, Colin, um, when you're in negotiations with an attacker, it's something that, that you're talking about. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned, I think, earlier when you, when you talk to law enforcement, that notification might become critical down the road when, um, if uh, in light of the OFAC advisory notice. Yeah, what, I mean, at this stage, you know, OFAC, this notice sort of, um, I don't know, formalized what was already a pretty uh, common practice, uh, I think standard practice when it came to paying ransomers. Um, we, the uh, vendors we were using would run an OFAC check and make sure that these folks are not uh, on the you know, terrorist watch list, basically, or they're known to be a, a, a nation state um, connected to Iran or North Korea or other other uh, known known enemies, really. So, um, you know, it's, it's vital at this point uh, per this guidance to make sure that that check is being done. It has been, it will continue to be. And you know, if you find that you're dealing with, unfortunately, there are a few groups out there that are um, still attacking, even though they're not allowed to be paid. And I've had a number of matters recently where we're dealing with one of those. And we talk about backups. You better have some good backups then because you can't pay. We cannot pay the ransom. We cannot negotiate. Um, we can't represent you or work with you if you're going to pay them. And you're not going to be able to get vendors to do that typically either. Um, so it's, uh, it's real important to have that check done and, and be, make sure we're not, uh, not sending money to somebody who is not allowed to receive it per U.S. law. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, a new a, a wrinkle that's been made you know, more people have been made more aware of now. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be more coming from the United States government. Uh, so we're we're at 115 now, and so we really wanted to kind of open this up. Uh, you know, certainly day, day five, six, seven, eight are going to be continuation, and and hopefully continuing to trend towards the positive. You know, employees coming back to work, being able to uh, to communicate. Uh, uh, negotiations with the the attacker might be ongoing. Uh, but hopefully things are starting to trend to the positive um, and you start to realize the implications of the attack, those sorts of things. But we really wanted to uh, open up to questions from our attendees. Um, and you can certainly, again, email uh, events at mcdonaldhopkins.com or throw it in the in the chat box here. Uh, as this is our last session, we thought, well, let's let's do a, a Q&A for the last, you know, five, ten minutes uh, that uh, so people can ask kind of the questions they want. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of end the, the, the PowerPoint here and then uh, please submit questions now so that we can, while well, we got this uh, great panel together, uh, whatever you got, I'm sure somebody, um, yeah, you know, somebody's got something out there. So let's, let's bring on the questions. While we're waiting for the questions to come in, I know that there's always different, um, Different nuances and things that we're not that are new and, and Ronnie, we yeah you you and I talked about one this week you know how the attacker was manipulating um, uh, email uh, which I thought was fascinating it was something I'd never heard and I'm not sure anyone else has I think yeah that was new for you and, uh, and if you're able to kind of describe what that attack looked like that you were working on this week yeah yeah and i'll keep it short and sweet but essentially it was a uh, an organization that had multi-factor enabled on an office 365 tenant for all their users doing a lot of the right things from the security side of things in terms of controls and compensating controls and they still ended up with uh you know 
with some email account compromise as well as business email compromise. And essentially what happened was the attacker was able to sniff out, um, you know, through either social engineering or maybe some key logging or whatever it might be. Uh, unknown at this point, we're still working the case, but they got the global admin for the Office 365 tenant. Uh, first thing they did was change, uh, you know, some of the organization information. So any reset to that password would have to be approved by them. And then they delegated or created a new uh, account and delegated that to everybody's mailbox that had MFA protected to where it was like a secretary who could send email on behalf of that particular uh, user in that organization. Uh, so they created that account. They made it delegated access to about 15 or or so mailboxes, and then they began uh, sending out uh, campaigns, creating you know malicious inbox rules, things like that, to be able to kind of obfuscate their presence in that in that mailbox. And then they started spamming, you know, essentially falsified or fraudulent uh, invoices and things of that nature. So a very unique uh, way of coming in, getting a little bit clever. Um, so we're we're starting to pay attention to a couple of these end around type of moves these guys are doing. Well, that's fascinating. We had a, had a question come in, and so uh, entry question, you know, Chris and Ronnie, um, in your previous roles as CISOs in the private sector, you know, to prepare your IT and security personnel for these types of things, I mean, what um, what does a training, uh, recommended training look like? Like, what do you, where did you try and get your folks to first, you know, from a sequence to get them up to speed and keep them up to speed on, on cybersecurity? Yeah, you know, I think there are, um, you know, there are a couple of things with that. You know, I, I think um, your, your internal processes, you know, one, you need processes. Um, you know, how are you going to handle an event? You can't just throw a bunch of people in a room and, and let them figure it out. Um, it's, it's not efficient and efficiency is a major component when it comes to um, fighting these types of things. So, you know, training people up um, inside and outside of IT security, a, a lot of IT should uh, should understand what your incident response processes look like. Uh, your employees should understand what your incident processes are. You know, who do I, if I have an issue, who do I call? You know, I, do I just open an email to the uh, um, our service desk and, and wait? Is there a, a special security at domain.com that, uh, that I forward things to? Um, but within the uh, within the security team, you know, th there's a lot of training, and and I would um, a lot of training opportunities, and I, I think it, much is best spent um, understanding your your tools and capabilities. It's it's far too often that we go into uh, organizations, and they they have you know X brand email filter, they have Y brand firewall, they have Z brand endpoint. And they're they're there. The the company has spent money invested, but you know, are are they configured properly? Are they working? Are, do the people know how to monitor uh, those things appropriately? And, and again, once alerted, do they have processes to uh, to act? Um, you know, so there are a lot of different components when it comes to you know training. I th I think the operational aspects are are, are critical. Um, you know, but certainly understanding your tooling and capabilities are um, important as well. Yeah, and you know, Chris, that's absolutely right. And those fundamentals as well, in terms of having the right people in the right seats, and those guys knowing who's who in the zoo, right? That that process is an extremely rigid process where each and every one of those actions and decision points are are critical to the success of that. And conducting those tabletop exercises, raising visibility to the people in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, big picture wise, depending on the type of incident, not everything is ransomware, right? We just talked about email account or business email account compromise. You know, we, we, we need to understand what everybody's role is and why they need to do what they need to do. And then chain of command is obviously very, very important here. You don't want any rogue players just off doing whatever they feel is best at the time in the heat of the moment, et cetera. So having some very rigid processes, like Chris uh, mentioned, I, I would hammer that home uh, 100%. And, and also, Ronnie, uh, how critical it is there was a question about, you know, checklists, you know, uh, where, do, do we have checklists? Are there checklists created on as you go through these processes, you know, post uh, post breach? I mean, those are all going to be built into your your um, your incident respond plan, your business continuity plan and those sorts of things. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want a quick and easy one, just go download like NIST special publication 861. Right. I mean, you can get it rather quickly. 
but it's really the, you know what you're trying to achieve in terms of that impact to the organization. You may have specific ways that you want to bring the environments back up, certain things that matter, certain things that don't. Um, you know, so checklists are great. Uh, I prefer run books and workflows, things that have decision trees so you understand, hey, if this, then that, else this, those kind of things. So it, it's preparation and muscle memory. It's not paint by numbers. If you're if you're in the middle of a ransomware incident and you're pulling out a book and you're trying to follow the instructions on the way, you're not going to have very much success. It's good to document it for turnover and things like that, but you don't want to you want to know it, live it, and breathe it, right? And there was a question about security clearances. And while some of us, all of us, might have security clearances as we talk about data breaches, unless the victim company um you know is maintaining classified information uh you know we wouldn't uh security clearance really wouldn't be uh be an issue so uh that that was a question that came in and, and uh, there was a question about the difference between uh the backup process and restoration uh you know can you talk about the difference there either chris or ronnie The um, you know the they are two separate things, and uh, um, or organizations operationally will back up their data. Um, you know they they will um, either disk to disk or disk to disk to tape or disk to disk to cloud, uh, a lot of different ways. Well, how often are you backing things up? What's the technology you're using? Um, you, you have systems that are active. Um, you know your ERP system has a database. How are you actively backing up that database while there are changes occurring to it? Um, and once you have everything backed up, this is where restoration occurs. Well, um, you you hope you never need it. You know it's um, it, it's something that you uh, never want to have to uh, talk about or do. Um, but in the event that you have uh, data corruption system failure, data loss, you need to recover. Um, you know, so-and-so deleted a folder. Well, we can recover it back from uh, from our backup tapes, backup systems, whatever, whatever we have, whatever we employ. Um, but do you have good sound processes, tested processes? And, and IT itself is uh, a very organic thing. There are new applications, new versions, updates, new servers going in, old servers leaving. This thing is constantly in motion. Um, I've, I've never seen a, a data center look one week, uh, the, the same week over week over week. Um, being able to understand what your capabilities are and, and how you recover is important. Ransomware is going to destroy much of what you have. Have you tested how long it takes to uh, to go through a recovery exercise using your backups? Um, you know, mo most companies, you know, kind of put the blinders on a little bit and they look only at backups. Do we have backups? Yes. You know, I've got a tape here. Our data is on it. Well, are you sure it's going to work? How long is it going to take? Um, you know, in not just one system, but all of your systems or or a larger application. Um, applications are, are often very complex now. It's not one installation on one server. You, you may have three web servers, six application servers, and three database servers talking to a cloud instance. Well, what does your recovery look like for you know th those eight on-premise systems? It, it's it's not easy. Well, great points. Well, we're uh, re nearing the uh, uh, nearing 1:30, kind of the end of the session. Uh, my sincere thanks to, to Chris, Colin, and Ronnie for your time. Uh, so many great questions today. Uh, uh, great class. Really appreciate everybody's insight. Um, really, really uh, some, some good material. So I would ask all the, the attendees uh, to please complete the survey when it, when it comes out. Uh, this will be, uh, was recorded and will be uh, pushed out online if you have uh, want to uh, review it again. And if there's any questions after the broadcast, you know, certainly send them in to events at mcdonaldhopkins.com and we will we'll circle back with you individually. Uh, but my sincere thanks to the three of you. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Be safe and we will uh, talk again soon. Take care, all.